Hello and welcome everybody. We are here for a video that is going to be extremely comprehensive. I am doing this video as a dedication to having received 100 subscribers, so thank you guys for the support. And like I mentioned, this video is going to be very dense. This is about the patterns that can be involved in casting Titan and killing your opponent with Primeval Titan, be it with Stronghold and Sunhome or Valkyrie triggers or whatever. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, then that's fine, as I will explain it over the course of this video. But I wanted to let you know that if you are not very invested in learning Amulet Titan or are easily bored by long and complicated lines, then this is not the video for you. This is going to be a long one, I guarantee it. So. Just letting you know ahead of time that it may not be your cup of tea. But anyways, like I said, today we are going over patterns, patterns, and more patterns. This is going to be every relevant pattern, including the various types of ramp cards that we play, a lack of amulet, one amulet, two amulets, three amulets, as many lines as I can think of, kill sequences, all kinds of stuff. If that's something that you're interested in, then this is the video for you. And let's just jump straight into it. So, of course, I'm going to start out with a little bit of an introduction here, just for those of you who are not super familiar with Amulet. Obviously, the plan for Amulet Titan is to cast Primeval Titan, preferably ahead of schedule. Um, like I said, we'll cover what different ramp spells we use. We'll cover the different combinations of ramp spells and how they interact with each other. We'll look at some common lines for playing Titan and common kill patterns as well. But Ultimately, the goal is to take our 6-mana six 6-6 six, six Trampler that gives us a billion lands, put it into play and attack with it, and we do that with the help of Amulet and Bounce Lands. So Amulet is a 1-mana artifact that untaps any permanent that enters the battlefield tapped under our control. So if you play a land that enters tapped, for example, the Amulet will untap it. And then uh, in combination with Simic Growth Chamber or any other Bounce Land, there's one of these for every single 2-color combination. So there's a blue-green one, there's a blue-red one, a red-green one, a green-white one. Every single color combination that you can think of, there is a bounce land for. And these are unique because they interplay tapped. They force you to pick up a land or return a land to your hand. But in return, they tap for two mana. So these interact very interestingly with Amulet because you can, with an Amulet out, play a Simic Growth Chamber, stack the triggers so that the bounce is the last thing to happen, untap your Simic Growth Chamber using the Amulet ability, float two mana, and then pick up any land. It could be the growth chamber itself or any other land. So basically, in combination with Amulet, these lands, uh, known as bounce lands, tap for two mana, and using additional land plays, we can ideally cast our Titan on turn two, turn three, turn four at the latest, I would say, and we'll get into how that works a little bit later. So obviously with Amulet, we're going to have some interesting interactions between our lands and our amulets and figure out how much mana that we can make. So like I said, a bounce land produces two mana for every amulet in play. So if you have two amulets, that's two untapped triggers. You get to untap, float two, untap, float two more. So you just multiply two by the number of amulets you have in play, and that'll give you how much mana a bounce land will produce for you. If you have a crumbling vestige, this is going to float one of any color when it enters the battlefield, of course. And then it's going to give you one colorless, which it taps for, for every amulet that you have in play. So crumbling vestige comes into play tapped, triggering both the amulet to untap it and also it entering the battlefield to make a mana. So you can float one of any color and then untap the vestige for every amulet trigger it gets. So that's going to be at least two mana if you have one amulet in play and three mana if you have two amulets, so on and so forth. Then finally, we have Castle Garenbrig, which is a land that filters four mana into six mana, as long as that six mana is specifically for creature spells and abilities of creatures. So for casting specifically Primeval Titan, I like to count Castle Garenbrig as a two mana source, as it takes four mana and turns it into six mana. But otherwise, I just count it as basically like a forest. It just taps for a green. And those are the lands that we'll be looking at. So let's move into some of our ramp spells. So the I'm going to just start from the very bottom of the curve and then move our way up here at the one mana spells. The most common ones, other than Amulet, of course, are Grazer and Sakura Tribe Scout. Arboreal Grazer is a one mana 0-3 with Reach that comes into play and lets you immediately put a land from your hand on the battlefield tapped. Sakura Tribe Scout is a one mana 1-1 one one that taps to put a land into play. So obviously... Your Tribe Scout doesn't have haste, so it's not going to be able to do this the same turn that you play the Tribe Scout, but after it survives one turn cycle, you'll be able to tap it and put lands into play. And for every turn after that, you can continue to tap your Tribe Scout and get more activations out of it. There are some subtleties between these two cards that make it a very interesting debate over which card is the better one to play. 
In fact, some people play four grazers, some people play four scouts. I myself like to play four scouts at the moment with three grazers in the sideboard. Some people play a split. So let's go over some of the reasons real quick why these cards are not effectively the same card, why one might be better than the other. Grazer has the following advantages. It enables a turn five Titan. So you play a Grazer anytime up until turn five and it gives you an extra land and then you can play Titan on turn five rather than turn six. And with Castle Garenbrick specifically, assuming that you have the mana to activate it, you'll be able to play Titan on turn four. We will cover these lines later. So if you're confused, then don't be worried about it. Um, in comparison, Scout enables a turn four Titan because not only does it put a land into play on turn two after you've played it, but also on turn three. So it allows you to play a turn four Titan by itself. And then if you have Garen Brig and the requisite untapped sources and green mana, you'll be able to cast Titan on turn three rather than the earliest being turn four for Grazer. So obviously the very biggest, most important reason is that Scout more frequently enables a turn three Titan just by itself. It's better on Mulligans, for example. However, there are some other subtleties between the two cards. For example, Arboreal Grazer trades very favorably with removal spells. Say your opponent casts a Lightning Bolt on your Arboreal Grazer. Well, not only are you getting a Lightning Bolt from your opponent's hand, you're also having automatically put a land into play. So it has the effect that you want it as soon as it comes into play, and then also collects a card from your opponent's hand that's great for you. Whereas Scout, if it just dies the same turn that you play it or before you ever get to activate it, it usually will trade neutrally since it is a one mana spell. So if your opponent uses a one mana lightning bolt or fatal push to kill your scout, technically you've both spent a mana, you've both spent a card, and neither of you really got a whole lot out of it. So it's a neutral there. If your opponent casts anything that costs two or more, like an abrupt decay or a um, eliminate, for example, to kill your scout, then you've actually gone up on tempo. Neither of you has additional cards, but one of you spent one mana and one of you spent two mana. And sometimes that can have an impact. Like if your turn one scout gets turned to drown the locked, for example, then your opponent's not holding up a one mana spell like an opt or a spell snare or whatever. So that additional mana can have an impact, although it's very um, slight. So hence why I say it's a quote unquote favorable if it trades with a two plus mana removal spell um, only only on tempo. However, another big difference is that Arboreal Grazer ignores cards like Renin Six and Lava Dart. Both of these cards are effects that can deal one damage exactly to a creature or player. Arboreal Grazer, being a 0-3 creature, doesn't care about a Rin or a Lava Dart paying for a damage. However, these little inconsequential one points of damage can just kill your Tribe Scout before you ever get the chance to activate it, and that can be quite devastating as Lava Dart can be recast from their graveyard to do other things, and Renin Six stays around in a cruise value by getting additional lands and stuff. If you're not familiar with these cards, then feel free to look them up so you can get an idea for what I'm talking about. So obviously, against those specific cards and the strategies that would play these cards, Grazer is going to be better than Scout marginally against those decks, because oftentimes your Scout will just die, whereas your Grazer will at least get your land into play and also be a valuable body that doesn't die to these types of effects. Now we move on to the next difference between the two. Grazer enables you to play a turn two Dryad or Azusa pretty easily. As long as you have a single bounce land and an untapped source that casts Grazer, you can go turn one Grazer, put in your bounce land and pick up your untapped source. Then turn two, you can play your untapped source and immediately slam a Dryad or an Azusa, one of your three drops. This comes up quite a bit, but it is worth noting that sometimes you actually don't want to have to leave your bounce land in play, especially in a deck that plays Amulet of Vigor. A lot of times it's better to be able to play your bounce land once, float two mana, and pick it back up. If it's already on the battlefield and you can't get it back into your hand, obviously you're not going to be able to do that. So with additional repeated land drops and an amulet, sometimes exposing your bounce land, putting it into play, and leaving it in play is not the best thing. So that can be a detriment, even though it does cast your turn to Dryad or Azusa pretty consistently. Whereas Tr Sakura Tribe Scout, since... um. Since it requires you to have untapped sources, both an untapped land on turn one to cast it, and then two untapped sources on turn two, one to play and one to put into play with Scout, uh, it's pretty uncommon to get an Azusa or a Dryad into play on turn two with Scout. However, that is at the uh, advantage of you're not encouraged to play your bounce lands early. So your opponent who's trying to destroy your bounce lands with a pillage or, or stone rain type effect, you're not playing into that. You can hold your bounce lands for potentially top decking an amulet. You can use it to do little instant speed tricks that we'll cover in a second. So that actually can be an interesting upside. It's very theoretical, but it, it does occur. Additionally, Arboreal Grazer being a 0-3 creature encourages, 
encourages our opponent to commit to the board to try to attack through your grazer, trying to put more creatures into play so they can get damage through as this is a bit of a roadblock. Whereas Soccer Tribe Scout actually encourages your opponent to interact with the scout as opposed to doing anything else. So if your opponent only has one land and they have the choice of either bolting your scout or casting a one mana creature like a Soul Scar Mage or a Monastery Swiss Spear, then that's an interesting catch 22 because if they leave the scout alive, they let us get that land drop out of it and then potentially let us continue to do so later down the line. So they're actually encouraged to just go ahead and use their time and resources to kill the scout as opposed to furthering their own game plan. So these two effects can be interesting and good in different environments. For example, if you have an engineered explosives that you want to wipe the board with and you play a grazer, your opponent is incentivized to play more creatures onto the battlefield to try to attack through your grazer that will now just get swept up by your board wipe, for example. Whereas scout encourages your opponent to slow down just a little bit. Obviously, Grazer being a 0-3 reach creature makes it a great blocker. Anything with 2 power is not going to be able to get through your Grazer, and Grazer can even block flyers, so obviously that's something that Grazer can do that Scout cannot. Scout can, at best, chump block only ground creatures, and that's not really that great. Another thing to note is that Grazer puts your land into play immediately, so if you have an amulet in play that's going to untap whatever land you put into play, then that's obviously going to give you at least one mana back if it's just a regular land. And if it's a bounce land, you take your one green and convert it into two mana from your bounce land. So it can even be plus one mana with amulet. So if you have five mana, a grazer, and a titan, and an amulet in play, you can play a grazer down to four mana, put in a bounce land, tap it for two, having six mana floating so you can now cast your primeval titan. Things like that can come up. And in fact, it's actually sometimes a relevant summoner's pack target for that reason, as it does let you go up one mana in a pinch. And uh, that's something that Grazer has that's very unique to it that Scout doesn't really do. If you have a Scout in your hand, it's never going to help you ramp in the moment. It's always going to be a ramp next turn kind of deal, whereas Grazer's not that way. And of course, with Grazer, already getting your land into play means that you can immediately and freely block with your Grazer. Even if it dies, you don't care because as soon as it's coming to play, it does what it wanted to. So you can absorb however much damage you want to and let the Grazer go, and it's no big deal at all. Whereas with Scout, if you want to both block with it and get a land out of it, then you will be forced to wait a turn with your Scout rather than immediately blocking with it, which can be pretty detrimental. For example, against an Infect deck where you want to block your opponent's Glistener Elf, but you really need to get that land drop because you're trying to accelerate past your opponent if at all possible. Scout's kind of awkward as it does let you block, but it comes at the very real cost of not actually getting a land out of it, whereas Grazer doesn't have that problem. But like I said, there are some uniquenesses to Scout that make up for some of these detriments. For example, Scout lets you tap to put a land into play at instant speed. So this is something you can do during your opponent's turn. This can be good against land destruction. That's what this LD stands for. So like if your opponent points a land destruction spell like a Stone Rain at one of your lands, you can flash in with your Scout a bounce land to then pick up the land that they're targeting and effectively just hard counter their land destruction spell. That can be quite powerful. It also lets you flash in a bog, a bajuka bog at instant speed to exile your opponent's graveyard. Um, it can flash in lands at instant speed to get Valcat triggers from a dryad, which we'll cover later. It also flashes in sun home during your combat phase if you want to be able to double strike and need sun home in play rather than in your hand. Uh, Scout will let you do that. You can even get a bounce land and a sun home, pick up the sun home, and then flash it in at instant speed You know when you've searched for these lands off of your titan attack trigger and still be able to potentially double strike your titan so these are some of the little things that scout can do that make it look very unique compared to grazer and then also of course scout does have one point of attack so just by itself you can use it to pressure quote unquote a planeswalker swing for one at your opponent's karn liberated to take it from three to two so it can't do another minus three on you that's something that comes up that's mainly the reason why i put this here but it can technically pressure other planeswalkers as well like a uh, Ashiok, for example. So it does have one point of attack that lets you pressure your opponent even just a little bit or their Planeswalkers, and that can come up. All right, so moving on to our two-mana ramp spells. Other than Explore, which you see on the screen here, two-mana ramp spells are pretty uncommon to see in Amulet, and uh, there's a very good reason for that. It's because if you play a turn one Amulet, Scout, or Grazer, any of these three, it'll let you skip two mana entirely, and immediately be able to play a three mana spell on turn two. So a lot of times, a turn one one drop into a turn two three drop is the type of curve that we're looking for, and oftentimes two mana ramp spells like Explorer and Sakura Tribe Builder don't really fit into that schedule. That said, Explorer is frequently played 
And there are several reasons for that. The first one is that with Scout, in order to play a three drop on turn two, you would have to have another two untapped sources, and that's just pretty uncommon. So if you don't have those additional two land sources that you would need to play a three drop on turn two with Scout, instead, you can use just a measly single untapped source or even a bounce land to pick up the untapped source you played on turn one to play a two drop on turn two, such as Explore. So Explore and other two drops like Soccer Tribe Elder do tend to work a little bit better with Scout than with Grazer, of course. Explore in particular sees quite a bit of play in the Amulet Shell because it quote unquote doesn't cost us a card. Uh, and basically what that means is we get some effect from the Explorer without actually going down on cards. We cast the Explorer from our hand, but we get to draw a card, so it, it replaces itself, and we do get the additional land drop effect from the Explorer. So that can be quite good, especially against decks where the number of cards that we have in our hand matters. Um, against like slower, more controlling decks where you just want to have more business and don't care about speed necessarily, Explorer can be quite good. In times past, other Primeval Titan decks, such as Scapeshift or the Simic Titan Field decks that you might be familiar with that were popular during the Oko meta, things along those lines, would play Sakura Tribalder as a two-mana ramp spell. Amulet usually does not, and the main reason for that is that Explorer helps us find an additional card, so whatever the pieces that we're missing to complete our turn three or turn four or turn two even, a Titan sequence, we might be able to find it off of the top with our draw card from Explorer, whereas with Sakura Tribe Elder, you will get a guaranteed land for sure, but um, you're not going to get any closer to casting Primeval Titan that way if you don't already have a Primeval Titan in your hand, whereas Explorer will let you get that additional land drop while also digging a card deeper, so that card really does matter. So, moving on to our three mana ramp spells, we have Azusa, Lost But Seeking, and Dryad of the Elysian Grove. Again, this is kind of a similar situation to Scout versus Grazer, except this one is... Uh, a lot more lopsided in favor of Dryad, I would say. So Azusa is a three mana one, two that lets you play two additional lands. So one for turn plus two from Azusa is three land drops in the turn that you have an Azusa in play. Whereas Dryad is a three mana two, four that allows you to play only one additional land, but it also makes lands you control every basic land type in addition to their other types. And that can be relevant for specifically the card Balakut, the Molten Pinnacle, which we'll cover in just a second. But with a Dryad in play, you have one land for turn plus one land from hand, which is only two land drops as compared to Azusa's three total land drops in the turn that you have an Azusa in play. Um, so obviously with one additional land drop, Azusa is going to allow you to cast Titan a little faster, and it'll turn out that Azusa will allow you to cast Titan a little easier as well. It requires fewer untapped sources in general. And uh, again, we'll cover those lines. We're still getting there. Uh, this is still kind of introductory information at this point. Um, however, we'll see that with Azusa, when you cast your Titan, your Titan kind of has to be good enough to kind of just do its thing and win the way that Titan would usually win, either by setting up another Primeval Titan with Tolari West or being able to attack and double strike. If your Titan isn't good enough by itself, like let's say you go to haste your Titan and it gets path to exiled, you're kind of left with nothing. Whereas with Dryad of the Elysian Grove, because of its interaction with Valcut and the Molten Pinnacle, we'll be getting some additional things just by virtue of having a Dryad in play being able to get some direct damage with Valakut. So again, we'll look at that in a second. But Azusa really asks your Titan to be good enough by itself, whereas Dryad gives a little bit of oomph to your Titan, letting the lands it search for do a little more impactful thing. So with Azusa and an amulet and a bounce land, your Azusa will take its the three mana that it costs and give you two land plays, which is four mana back. So it takes your three mana and turns it into four mana, which essentially nets you one mana in the turn that you play Azusa. Whereas Dryad will cost you three mana to play, and then you only get one additional bounce land after he comes into play. So that's taking your three mana and turning it into two mana. So if you're going to try to play these in addition to a Titan, you need to be aware that playing a Dryad will cost you a mana in the long run, whereas playing an Azusa will actually net you a mana. So it's sort of similar to Grazer, the way that Azusa interacts. Um, but we'll also see that Azusa can be a little weak to removal spells, whereas Grazer gives you that additional mana immediately. Azusa, you need to get both land drops out of it after you play it in order to get your full four mana. Otherwise, it's just going to cost you a mana like Dryad did. So, All right, so I did mention this, and now it's time to explain it. What am I talking about when I say Valakut and Molten Pinnacle triggers? Well, with Dryad and Valakut in play, you get to do some direct damage. Valakut and the Molten Pinnacle says that... Uh, Whenever a mountain enters the battlefield under your control, if you control at least five other mountains, so six mountains in total, you may have Valakut and Molten Pinnacle deal three damage to any target. On this card, it says target, creature, or player, but it has been errated, so it's any target, 
player, planeswalker, it doesn't matter. And uh, it's otherwise just a red land. And of course, the way this interacts with Dryad is that Dryad makes each of your lands every basic land type in addition to their other types. And that includes mountains. So the Valkut itself is also a mountain. So with six lands in play, every land that you play with the Valkut on the battlefield will trigger Valkut, including the Valkut itself. So the way that you calculate how much damage you're going to be doing with a Valkut is you take the number of Valkuts that are going to be in play, multiply that by the number of lands that are going to be entering play, and each of those will represent one trigger of the Valkut, and each trigger is good for three damage. So multiplying the number of Valkuts in play by the number of lands coming into play, and then multiplying by three will give you the amount of total damage that you'll be doing with Valkut triggers. And if some of this more basic stuff is new to you, and I'm moving a little too fast with it, and then you need to check out my previous introductory to Amulet video where I even give a couple exercises so that you can get an idea for how to put some of this stuff into practice and uh, a lot more in-depth detail about the card choices and basics of Amulet. Um, so I'm not going to cover any more of the, I guess, more basic stuff here. This is where we get to jump into the lines and uh, patterns sections. So let's just go straight into that. So we're going to start out with the lines that involve zero Amulet of Vigor and work our way up from there as uh, Amulet does add some extra complexity. And this is kind of, I guess you could say, the baseline for each of our ramp cards and how fast it does what it does. And another thing that I want to note here before I move on is these are not things that you have to memorize in order to play Amulet at all. You definitely don't need to memorize these. As you play, they'll become more and more familiar to you. A lot of times you can look at your hand and kind of calculate on the spot when you'll be playing what lands at what time and just try to think it out ahead of time before you make any plays. And usually it's not super difficult to figure out, especially if you're vaguely familiar with the patterns, which is why I'm doing this video now. So you can get an idea for what these patterns kind of look like and the main key cards that are involved. So the first pattern that we're going to look at is the Scout, Castle Garenbrig, and Turn 3 Titan pattern. If you have a Sacra Tribe Scout, an untapped source like a forest, Castle Garenbrig, this is likely to allow you to cast Primeval Titan on turn three. And more specifically, for this to work, you're going to need a hand that contains a Sakura Tribe Scout, a Castle Garenbrig, any forest, be it a breeding pool type forest that comes into play untapped and has the word forest on it, or even just a basic forest. And then you're also going to need either a bounce land or any land plus any untapped land, either of those two conditions. These will allow you to cast Primeval Titan on turn three. So this starts by playing your forest on turn one and playing Sakura Tribe Scout. And then on turn two, you're going to play just any other land and activate your scout to put in a tap land. So, for example, in this case, we'd play Valcut, activate scout, and put in Simic Growth Chamber and pick up our forest. Then, on turn three, you play your forest and you activate scout to put in your Garenbrig, which will enter untapped thanks to your forest. That's why it's important to have specifically a forest. And you have your six mana required to cast Titan if you activate Castle Garenbrig. So, obviously, you're going to need double green in order for this to work out, but um, this is kind of the quintessential turn three Titan line that you hear about when it comes to Sakura Tribe Scout versus Grazer type arguments. These five cards on their own are capable of casting Primeval Titan. Grazer would make this a turn four Titan at the earliest. And um, yeah, this uh, requires not very many cards. This is easily accomplished on a mulligan and it's a very basic pattern. So now we're going to directly compare this to that line where we use Grazer instead of a Tribe Scout. So if you have a Grazer, a Garenbrig, any green source, a Bounce Land, or any other two lands, and then one untapped source, this lets you cast Titan as early as turn four. So turn one, you're going to play a, a green source. If it's untapped, that's great. You can just go ahead and put your Arboreal Grazer into play. But it's no sweat if it doesn't enter untapped. So in this case, I've used a Colony Garden because it's a green source that enters tapped. So we're going to play our Colony. On turn two, we're going to play a Tap Land. For example, a Simic Growth Chamber. We're going to float our green with our Colony Garden and pick it up, as we do have to pick up a land to the Growth Chamber. And then we're going to use that green to play Grazer and then put a land into play. So we'll just put that Colony back into play. Then on turn three, we have a land. And on turn four, we have an untapped land and activate Garenbrig to cast Titan. Um, of course, the uh, turn four step here, playing the untapped land, is kind of shortcutted by Tribe Scout. This can be blended into turn three because the Scout gets to tap to put another land into play, whereas Arboreal Grazer doesn't have that ability. So that's why Scout lets this line work on turn three to play Titan, whereas Grazer only lets it work on turn four. And like I said, if you have an untapped green source, you can play Grazer anytime before turn two. You could play it on turn one if you want to, but ultimately it's not actually going to change the fact that you're playing your Titan on turn four. It's just going to give you some additional blocks, but it'll still be the same turn four Titan regardless. 
All right, so the first one that we're gonna look at now for our three drops here is the Azusa pattern and how Azusa leads to a turn four Titan. We'll see that both Azusa and Dryad lead to a turn four Titan with some slight differences. So if you have a hand that contains Azusa, two untapped sources or one untapped source and a bounce land, two green sources, and then any two other lands, this will allow you to cast your Primeval Titan on turn four. Uh, the reason being that you can rebuy your one untapped source if you pick it up with a bounce land. So that's why you can have one untapped source and a bounce land here. And uh, this is the collection of cards that is the most condensed, the, the fewest number of cards you can use that allows you to accomplish this. The way that this is going to play out is you're going to play a land on turn one, for example, like Colony Garden. You're going to play a land on turn two, of course. And uh, for example, in this case, we'd use a Growth Chamber and pick up that Colony Garden, put it into our hand. Uh, it's important that you have some kind of green source lined up for turn three here. Either a green source is in play already if it entered tapped, or you have an untapped green source on turn three. Um, either way, you need to be able to play your Azusa on turn three, so you do need a green in play. Then on turn three, of course, you're going to play your untapped land, so in this case, the Ghost Quarter, and you're going to play your Azusa, and you immediately get an additional land drop, so you're going to play a Gruul Turf, for example, and pick up the Ghost Quarter. And then on turn four, you're able to play your untapped land. That's going to be your six mana to cast Titan, so Azusa does let you play a Titan on turn four. It is important to note here that if you get to play both of your lands that Azusa grants you on turn three, like, for example, your opponent doesn't just lightning bolt it, then you don't actually need your Azusa and play at the beginning of turn four to even cast your Titan. Your Azusa could just die. Say your opponent has some sort of sorcery speed effect that kills your Azusa. Doesn't matter. You just play your untapped land, slam Titan. So that's uh, something unique about Azusa. And it only requires one untapped sources and bounce land or two untapped sources. So moving on to the Dryad line, we'll see that we actually need an additional untapped source. We're going to need three untapped sources or two untapped sources and a bounce land. And the reason for that is because you have to have two untapped lands in hand on turn four in order to play your Titan. You need both of your lands you're going to play that turn to enter untapped, which also means that uh, inadvertently you're going to need your Dryad to survive turn three and be alive at the beginning of turn four because this is what's going to give you your additional land drop. So you need one plus the one from the Dryad. So your Dryad has to live and you have to have an additional untapped source compared to Azusa. And the way this works is you play your turn one land, of course, for example, the Ghost Order. Turn two, you play some kind of tap land, say it's a growth chamber picking up the ghost quarter. Turn three, you're going to play your ghost quarter, play your dryad, and then play another into the battlefield tap land like Gruul Turf. So you're going to have Gruul Turf, Simic Growth Chamber, and Dryad, and play. You're going to use your Gruul Turf to pick up ghost quarter. So in your hand, you'll have Slayer Stronghold and ghost quarter. Then on turn four, you have to play both untapped sources, so the stronghold and the ghost quarter. And now you can cast Titan, but only if you do have enough untapped sources to play on turn four and your dryad is still alive. So it's a little more conditional than Azusa, a little less common, but it is possible to cast a turn four Titan with Dryad. It's just a little harder. And while I'm talking about turn four Titans, I do want to make a little bit of a personal note here. So some other content creators might suggest that a Titan on the play, even on turn four is good enough. I have to admit that I don't really agree with that philosophy. If other players who play Amulet Titan and do well with it, keep turn four hands and it works out for them, that's great, I suppose. But I've never really felt like the turn four Titan works out. And that's because oftentimes your opponent is trying to kill you on turn three, despite the fact that modern is supposedly a turn four format. So sometimes your turn four Titan won't even come into play before you're dead. Um, even if you have a dryad to go along with it, if you'd never get your Titan into play, it doesn't matter. So, and that said, if we're playing against slower decks that are more interactive, the turn four Titan still isn't that great because any kind of interaction spell, be it a discard spell to take your Titan, a land destruction to kill one of your lands, or a removal spell to kill your Dryad or Azusa and deny you from getting enough land offs to cast your Titan, these can be devastating to your turn four Titan hand as it's going to make it a turn five Titan hand instead. So even in those scenarios, I find a turn four Titan to be a little bit lackluster. So my suggestion would be only keep turn four Titan hands if you've mulliganed and don't feel comfortable going to a lower amount of cards, or if your opponent has mulliganed and you feel like the likelihood that they'll have a blisteringly fast start or a maximum amount of interaction, perhaps. If you feel like that is not extremely likely, then go ahead and keep your turn four Titan hand. But in the blind, if both players kept seven and you see a turn four Titan hand, I would suggest that you just throw it back and try to find something a little bit faster. That's just my opinion, though. And um, this also plays into why Scout is often said to be better than Grazer, as 
like we looked at before, Scout enables you to play a turn three Titan, which actually is fast enough to stop your opponent from killing you on turn three. Whereas a turn four Titan from Grazer just sometimes doesn't even cut it. So, all right. So we've looked at each card individually. Now we're going to start looking at some combinations of cards. So for example, if we put together a Scout and Explore, then we'll be able to cast a turn three Primeval Titan. This is accomplished if you have a Scout, an Explorer, a Forest, three untapped lands, and then two other lands. This will let you cast Titan on turn three, and you can replace any of these two non-forest lands with a Bounce land. You could replace two non-forest lands with a Garen Brig as well. Um, so this uh, assortment of cards over here is kind of, I guess you could say, the, the smallest or shortest amount of cards that you could use in order to accomplish this. Um, it's worth noting that this actually isn't faster than just using Scout by itself, as it's still casting Titan on turn three. But the one thing it does gain you is that you don't need quite as many untapped sources as before. You can sneak in a couple bounce lands or tap lands here and still be able to cast your turn three Titan thanks to the extra ramp from Explore. So you turn one, play your Forest and your Scout. Turn two, you play any land. If it's a bounce land, you flow to green, play your bounce land, pick up your Forest, and, and then you Scout in another land, an untapped source that lets you cast your Explore. So for example, you might play Forest, Scout, turn two, play Simic Growth Chamber, flow to green and pick up the forest, scout in the forest, and tap it for another green. You'll have a forest, a Simic Growth Chamber, a scout in play at this point, and two mana floating. You cast your explorer and play another land like a Valcut, for example. And then on turn three, you'll be able to just drop your Garen Brig and immediately activate for the mana to cast Titan. So this is a little less stringent. It would be correct to say that you could use Explore in these cases instead of some of those untapped sources that we looked at before. So it makes it a little easier to cast a Titan, but it does require this combination of two cards here. Now, there also is a route to casting a 3-drop on turn 2 using Soccer Tribe Scout. It's a little convoluted because opposite to what we looked at before with Explore, this is going to require you to have a lot of untapped sources in order to cast your Dryad or Azusa on turn two. And even more, if you want to be able to cast your Primeval Titan on turn three, you're going to need an untapped land for the scout, two untapped lands to cast your three drop, and then an untapped land or two to cast your, your uh, Primeval Titan on turn three. So this is asking for a lot, but um, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing. Uh, you can pause it here and read it if you want to, but I'm just mentioning that if you have a ton of untapped sources ready to go, you can play a scout and a Dryad and still be able to turn three a Titan. Just something worth mentioning. Now, we're going to look at the line that involves a Grazer, a 3-drop, and a turn 3 Titan. So the difference between this and the previous that we just talked about is Grazer will allow you to accomplish a turn 2 3-drop while also not demanding you have just so many untapped sources to cast your Titan on turn 3. So if you're playing Grazer instead of Scout, this is going to be a line that comes up more frequently to allow you to cast turn 3 Titans with uh, not many stipulations. In this case, we can use the cards that you see on screen here to do this. This is going to require you to have one of your three drops, of course, a Grazer, some untapped green source to play your Grazer on turn one, a couple of untapped lands, and a couple of other lands. Uh, and you can replace, for example, any of those two lands with a bounce land. You can do this several times, as I've shown here. So the line here involves playing your untapped green sources on turn one and playing Grazer and putting in some kind of tap land. So in this case, we'd put in the Simic Growth Chamber. So at the end of this turn, we'll have Grazer, Simic Growth Chamber in play, bouncing the Forest back to hand. Then on turn two, you play an untapped source. For example, the Forest or the Stronghold, doesn't matter. You'll have Growth Chamber and your untapped source to tap and play a Dryad. And now you get to play another tap land, for example, Gruel Turf, and pick up your untapped source. So in play, we'll have these four cards here. And in hand, we'll have these two. And then on turn three, you get to play untapped land, untapped land, Primeval Titan. So this is a much easier, more realistic route to playing a turn three Titan. This is one of the things that Grazer can do that Scout cannot. But like I said before, this does incentivize you to put your bounce lands into play rather than holding on to them. This can be a bit of a detriment if you happen to top deck an amulet, for example. So it does come up on occasion. Okay, so we've covered everything that I want to cover with zero amulets in play. So let's start involving Amulet of Vigor and see what happens. Also, I want to mention here for a second that from this point on, we're just going to assume that all of our creatures stay in play. We get all of the land drops we want to, and our opponent is just a goldfish over there doing literally nothing. Uh, these are all kind of like, I guess you could say, theoretical lines. So first of all, we need to look at what happens when you literally just have an Amulet of Vigor. 
So a hand that has Amulet, any four lands, and one bounce land is capable of playing Titan on turn five. Uh, hence why some people will say that Amulet by itself is already a ramp spell. So turn one, you play land. Turn two, you play land. Turn three, you play land. Turn four, you play land and your Amulet if you just literally top deck it on turn four. And then turn five, you play a bounce land, float two mana. That's two plus the four you already had in play is six to be able to cast Primeval Titan. So just one Amulet lets you cast Titan one turn ahead of schedule, assuming that you do have something like a Growth Chamber. Or I suppose that you could have enough green sources to activate a Garabrig and have Garenbrig instead. That'll let you turn five uh, Titan as well. However, this gets shortened by one turn if you have both an Amulet and a Garenbrig. And of course, the requisite green sources in order to activate Castle Garenbrig. So like, for example, we're getting a green from Colony Garden and Growth Chamber here. If you only had one green sources, you can't activate your Garenbrig. So it doesn't really work quite the same way. And in order to accomplish this, you need an Amulet, two lands, a Garenbrig, and then a Bounce Land that allows you to float a green. So, of course, you need to hit your green sources. Can't stress that enough. Um, but the way this works is turn one, you play any land. Turn two, you play any land. Turn three, you play your Garenbrig and your Amulet. And then on turn four, you play your Bounce Land, float your green green, and then two of any color, and activate your Garenbrig and cast Titan. So Amulet plus Garenbrig lets you shorten your Titan turn down to turn four. So now let's start incorporating a couple of additional ramp pieces other than just Amulet. Things are about to get a little more complicated. So this is the sequence that I like to call the turn two three drop. It could be an Azusa, it could be a Dryad. Either way, you're going to be able to play Titan on turn three. And this is going to require that you have an Amulet, one of those three drops, like I said, a green bounce land specifically, not Boros Garrison, unless you have like two just naturally green lands in addition to your Boros Garrison, which is a little unlikely. So you start off by playing a land on turn one, uh, an untapped land, and then playing Amulet out. So for example, Radiant Fountain plus Amulet. Then on turn two, you play your Bounce Land, like the Simic Growth Chamber, float three mana total, two from the Growth Chamber, one from the Radiant Fountain, and bounce your Growth Chamber back to your own hand. Of course, the lands that are entering tapped are untapped due to Amulet. So you have your three mana, you have a Radiant Fountain and an Amulet in play. You then play Azusa, and then play one additional land, like the Talari West. And then, even if you have no more lands at that point, on turn three, You'll be able to play Simic Growth Chamber, float to pick it back up, play it a second time with Azusa, float to pick it back up. That'll be four mana from the Growth Chamber, plus the two that you had in play already. That's six mana to go ahead and cast your Primeval Titan. Uh, and it's something similar for Dryad as well. You just play a Dryad on turn two and play two land drops on turn three and cast Titan. Both Azusa and Dryad work the same way in that regard. So we also want to look at what happens if we have Scout, a Bounce Land, and, and an Amulet. It's kind of similar, I suppose you could say. So on turn one, you're going to play some non-Bounce Land. On turn two, you can play your Amulet and play some sort of Green Land. Whether it enters untapped or not doesn't matter because the Amulet will untap it. So if you have, for example, turn one Bog, turn two, use the Bog to play Amulet, play Colony Garden, it'll still untap and let you play your Scout. And then on turn three, you have these two lands in play. You play the Bounce Land for turn, float, blue-green, pick it back up, scout in your bounce land, float blue-green, pick it back up, that's four, plus the two we had in play is six mana to cast Titan, so I suppose like like the previous one that we talked about before, the turn two, three drop, scout kind of has a similar effect, so. Now let's look at a bit of a more unique and a more recent interaction, uh, thanks to the printing of Castle Garenbrig. Azusa, Amulet, and Castle Garenbrig interact in a very unusual way. It allows Azusa by itself to cast a turn three Titan very easily. Um, so turn one, you play a land. It doesn't even have to be an untap land, just like, for example, a Bajuga Bog. Then turn two, you play your Amulet. You play your Garenbrig. And you don't need to have Azusa in play by this point. Um, if you want to wait on your Azusa so that it's not exposed to a removal spell, for example, or if you don't even have the Azusa in hand yet, but you top deck it on turn three, these two lands plus Amulet will let you cast Azusa off of this Gruul Turf, play it twice more, floating four mana, and then activate Garenbrig. So um, to put that in a little more perspective, we play turn one Bog, turn two we use it to play Amulet, and then play our Garenbrig. And then turn three, we play Gruul Turf, floating red and green, and then tapping the Bog as well for the third mana, and picking the Gruul Turf back up to its own trigger. Use our three mana with the Garenbrig untapped to play Azusa, play Gruul Turf for the second land drop, float two, play Gruul Turf for the third land drop, float two, activate Castle Garenbrig for six mana, boom, Titan. This lets you put an Azusa and a Titan into play on turn three if you didn't have Azusa on turn two. 
Um, so it's one of those unique patterns to be looking out for. Of course, this bounce land is going to need to be a green bounce land. Once again, Boros Garrison does nothing to help you activate Castle Garenbrig, so that's why the amulet lists typically only play one Boros Garrison. Is it's good for hasting, and that's about it. Okay, so let's start getting even more complicated. Now we're going to use our amulet and our Zusa to cast a turn two three drop, but we don't have the untapped source to play our amulet on turn one. So how are we going to accomplish getting this Azusa into play on turn two? Well, we can do this with the help of Arboreal Grazer, thanks to its ability to instantaneously put a land into play, something that Tribe Scout just doesn't do. So turn one, we play our tap land, for example, Talari West. Turn two, we play our amulet using our Talari West and then play a bounce land like Gruel Turf. Floating two, leaving a red floating and using the green to play Grazer after picking up the Gruel Turf to its own trigger. So we still have a red floating. Grazer comes into play. We get to put an additional land into play. So we put in the Gruel Turf for the second time. That's two mana, plus the red we had floating is three. Pick up the Gruel Turf to its own ability and use our three to play Azusa, and then just play any other land. For example, Bajuka Bog. I like to use this one in our examples because of the fact that it doesn't tap for a relevant color of mana. <laughs> but um, then on turn three, we'll have these two lands in play with Amulet and Gruel Turf ready to play multiple times. This is already kind of a familiar line at that point. Just play Gruel Turf twice, float four mana, use the two that you had in play, play Titan. So <laughs> I guess you could say this is the quote unquote slow turn two, three drop as you don't get to play your turn one amulet. Um, and Grazer lets you kind of fix for that by immediately getting your Azusa into play so you don't have to play it on turn three. So let's compare this to using a three drop and a scout. And uh, there's not really much of a comparison here because I couldn't think of any line where having Scout actually allows you to do anything extra, I suppose you could say, when it comes to Azusa and Dryad, because if you're using Dryad as your 3-drop to cast Titan, you're likely just going to be getting battle cut triggers for the win anyways, so the extra land drop from the Scout is unlikely to matter. And then with Azusa, you already have enough land drops to activate Sun Home, ready to go on turn 3 after you get your Titan into play, which is a kill line that we're about to go into very shortly. So. There's nothing really noteworthy about using Scout for your one drop as comparison to Grazer, uh, because Scout would require you to have an untap source in order to play Scout or Amulet on one. Grazer does something notable in that it takes your no untap source hand and still lets it play a turn three Titan. Scout doesn't really do that, so let's just go straight into some of the kill patterns. All right, so we're going for the kill. When you have Amulet in play, the Titan can actually attack the same turn that you play it, um, there are a couple ways to do this. You can do this by using Boros Garrison and Slayer Stronghold. Garrison making the red and white in order to activate your Slayer Stronghold, and Stronghold giving your Titan plus two plus zero oh, Vigilance and Haste. You can also use the Valcut and Hanweir Battlements plan. This has kind of fallen out of favor for a number of reasons that I've covered before. I'm not going to cover them here, but I do want you to know how this works. So Valcut makes a red. Hanweir lets you use a red and tap it to give a creature haste. So this is going to let you attack with your Titan, uh, because of course your Titan comes into play putting these lands from your deck into play tapped and then amulet untaps them and you can immediately go straight for the kill. Now it's worth noting that you only want to go for hasting your titan if it's free to do so because it's very possible you get your Valka and Hanweir activate targeting your primeval titan and they just go path to exile your titan. Now you have nothing, right? Or it could be assassin trophy. There's any number of interactive spells, a vapor snag for example, where Trying to attack with your Titan this tame turn that you play, it can be a little greedy. And uh, let's just look at some of the kill sequences, and then we'll talk about some alternatives to going for the kill in a second. So let's start with the Stronghold and Sun Home kill, the classic amulet kill, the one that's been around since the deck just um, like first started being played. This is something that you can do if you have an amulet in play and one land drop remaining. When you finish this line, you'll end up with a total of 16 combat damage. So um, obviously, if your opponent has taken damage and doesn't have any blockers and they're at 16 or less, then you'll be able to kill them. But that's only under those conditions. And also, if they don't have a way to kill your Titan, like a Path to Exile. So you have to take into account whether they have blockers, how much damage they've taken, and whether they could have interaction or not before you decide to go for this line. But the way it works is your Titan end of the battlefield trigger is going to search for Stronghold and Boros Garrison. And it'll put them both into play tapped, triggering Amulet to untap them, 
Um, bounce trigger still on the stack. You use your Boros Garrison to activate Slayer Stronghold, give her Titan plus two plus so Vigilance and Haste, and then pick up the Garrison to its own trigger because then immediately after all that resolves, you still have one land drop remaining. So you play your Boros Garrison. It'll untap thanks to the amulet and you pick up any other land. Then you go to combat, attack with your Primeval Titan and search for just another bounce land and Sun Home, the double strike land. You use your bounce land, your Boros Garrison to make four mana, including a red and a white. And you activate your Sun Home for a double strike so we've got an 8-6 Titan that's double striking for a total of 16 combat damage. And your Titan does actually have Trample as well. So if your opponent's at like, for example, 15 with a 1-1 one, one creature to chump block, it's only going to absorb one damage. So you can still do 16 minus the one from the block is 15 damage and kill your opponent at 15. So you do have to factor in that your Titan does have Trample. So, like I mentioned before, it's not always the case that 16 damage will be able to kill your opponent, and also, you may not want to go for the haste at all. You don't want to get blown out by these removal spells your opponent could have. So, what do you do instead? Well, it's pretty simple. If you have the ability to haste your titan immediately, because you know your opponent doesn't have a removal spell, but you can't deal lethal damage, then obviously you would attack with titan first, but even if you can't attack with titan, you can use your titan to search for Talari West and a bounce land. Uh, usually it would be the Simic because it taps for a blue, but it doesn't have to be. And then uh, you can pick up either the Bounce Land if you already have enough blue in play and just need to be able to make enough mana the turn after, or you could just straight up pick up the T-West if you already have enough blue in play to uh, transmute it and you don't need to play your Growth Chamber several times in order to make your blue. So either way, you're setting yourself up with a Talari West that can transmute for a Summoner's Pact and therefore get another threat. It could be a Dryad, it could be a Primeval Titan, that way, if your opponent does have the answer to your Primeval Titan that you just played, you still have another one back up and ready to go. So, that's something you can do. And if you already have a Bounce Land in your hand, for example, a Simic Growth Chamber, then you can search for a Talari West and just some other land that has some additional utility. Colony Garden to make a blocker, Radiant Fountain to gain some life, Bajuka Bog to exile a graveyard, Cavern of Souls to make your next Titan uncounterable in case your opponent just happened to be tapped out that turn. Valcut to set up for Dryad Triggers. There's a number of different possibilities, and it depends on who and what you're playing against, uh, what you get with your trigger in those cases. But it is possible, if you already have a Bounce Land ready to go, to set up some additional utility land rather than just getting the Bounce Land that you don't really need. So, so let's say that you have Stronghold and you want to kill your opponent and you have Dryad in play. Well... 16 is no longer the maximum amount of damage that you can do, thanks to Dryad plus Valcut triggers that we talked about before. If you have an Amulet, a Dryad, and two lands in play when your Titan resolves, that is good enough to get you 8 damage from the Titan attack and 4 Valcut triggers for 12 damage, and in total, that's going to be 20 damage at least, you know, assuming that you don't even do anything in your second main phase. So, at the very least, this is 20, which is enough to kill your opponent, usually, and... If you need additional triggers in your second main phase, you can accomplish that. The way this works is your Titan Enter the Battlefield trigger lets you search for Stronghold and a Crumbling Vestige. Uh, of course, Crumbling Vestige is the land that comes into play and adds a mana of any color when it comes into play, but also you can untap it and then tap it with Amulet. So, for example, you untap both of your lands with the Amulet, the Stronghold, and the Vestige. Float a white when the Vestige enters the battlefield using its add one mana of any color to your mana pool ability, and then tap it straight up for a red using your Dryad ability, because of course Dryad makes all of your lands every basic land type, so Crumbling Vestige is a mountain. It can make a red if you just tap it. So tap it for a red, float a white with the ability. That's enough to activate your Slayer Stronghold and go to combat. And importantly, when you do that, you'll still have four lands in play. So you'll have the Stronghold, the Vestige, and the two lands you started with, which is relevant because when you attack, you get two Val Cuts, and that'll be a total of six lands in play. Because remember, you need a total of six mountains for Valcut to be doing damage. Um, it doesn't matter whether they're literally mountains or not, because Dryad makes them all mountains, but you do need to have six. So that's why Vestige works. Uh, if you were to get Boros Garrison, then you'd be one land short, and there would be no Valcut triggers for you. Sad times. So your attack trigger searches for these two Valcuts, and since you do meet the six lands clause, you get two lands entering the battlefield times two Valcuts that would be in play, uh, which is a total of four triggers. Four triggers doing three damage each is going to be 12 damage in total. So the 8-6 Titan that you used your Stronghold on for the plus 2 plus 0, so your 8-6 Titan attacks for 8 damage, obviously, and then the 12 damage is 20 total. And uh, if your opponent has no blockers and no interaction, then that by itself is lethal. However, 
if you need to, in your second main phase, you can play some extra land drops to trigger battle cuts again and again. If you have as many land drops as you can play, you can get additional battle cut triggers in your second main phase. So oftentimes you can use this type of sequence to kill your opponent from even more than 20 damage. And unlike just trying to rely on Stronghold plus Sun Home, if your Dryad is in play, you can kill your opponent immediately, pretty easily. So it's definitely a very big bonus to playing Dryad. Okay, I hear what you're saying. You're saying, Red Face Menace, this is great and all, but I am not playing Stronghold. I prefer Han Weir Battlements, or I, you know, I'm net decking this list that 5 0 with Han Weir Battlements. How am I supposed to kill my opponent that way? Well, if you play Han Weir, you can still kill your opponent the same turn that you play and attack with a Primeval Titan. Again, this is going to require some similar um, prerequisites. You're going to need a Dryad, of course, an Amulet in play, and then two lands to be in play as your Titan resolves. Um, and this will deal at least 24 damage to your opponent. So your Titan into the battlefield gets Valcut and Hanweir Battlements. And the Valcut makes the red in order for you to activate Hanweir Battlements to haste your Titan. And then you can attack with your Titan and get a second Valcut and a Vesuva copying the first Valcut that you put into play. Obviously, if you didn't have a Valcut in play by this point, you couldn't copy it because Vesuva can't copy a land that's not already on the battlefield. These two come into play at the same time. There's no Valcut for it to copy when it's coming into play because the Valcut is also still coming into play. So you can't Vesuva a Valcut unless you already had a Valcut in play. So that's why this is important. Um, but your attack trigger gets a second Valcut and Vesuva copying the first Valcut. And that is going to be three Valcuts times two lands entering the Vesuva and the Valcut. And three damage per trigger is a total of 18 damage just from your Valcut triggers alone. Not to mention the 6 combat damage from your Titan going into the red zone, so that's going to be at least 24 damage. And of course, like I said before, if you need some additional damage in your second main phase, you can play some land drops and trigger Valcut. Another thing that's important to note is you don't necessarily have to have lands in your hand to get additional Valcut triggers in your second main phase. You can use Vesuva to copy, say, a bounce land, and then, you know, it'll do its damage when it comes into play after you attack and get Valcut plus Vesuva, you can stack the bounce on the bottom and then the Valcut triggers on top. So you do a bunch of damage and then have to pick up a land. You just have the Vesuva pick itself up. And then in your second main phase, as many times as you have, while you'll still have one land off remaining at the end, you can play your Vesuva copying bounce land, pick it back up after doing some damage. And then your last land drop, your Vesuva can copy one of the Valcuts that was in play for an additional like extra point of damage since you'll have three Valcuts instead of two. So at the very minimum, you'll be getting seven triggers out of this line, assuming that you just play one additional land drop. You get uh, Valcut, Hanweir on the edge of the battlefield, attack, get Vesuva copying bounce land and Valcut, and then that'll be a total of two triggers. You'll play Vesuva in your second main phase as a bounce land again. That'll be two more triggers, which is four, and then you'll pick it back up, and then you'll play it copying Valcut, which is going to be three more triggers. So plus the four we had before is seven total triggers for 21 damage from Valcut alone. Uh, that's if your Titan just dies immediately. Say your opponent lets you get to this point, and they didn't realize they needed to path your Primeval Titan before it ever attacked. Well, now they're just dead to Dryad, so... Oops. <laughs> and one thing I should mention is this kill, um, it's extremely non-conditional. Of course, your opponent does have to be at a relatively reasonable life total. So if your opponent's at like 36 or like 40 life or something, maybe they gained a bunch of life because they're playing Soul Sisters or whatever, then this may not be able to kill your opponent. But if your opponent's playing Storm and you resolve your Primeval Titan, go through the motions, they've f 6 Hanweir will let you kill your opponent immediately, guaranteedly. And that's not something that Stronghold can always do. So that's one of the benefits of playing Hanweir Battlements. Okay, all right. So we have made it to the next section, which is playing two amulets. If you have two amulets, what can you accomplish with this? And uh, as we go deeper and deeper into these multiple amulet lines, we're going to see fewer and fewer lines, of course, because the number of possibilities that you have access to goes up. But because some lines are just so arbitrarily powerful, there's only a few that you really need to know about. And uh, in the situations that come up where you can't just do the normal thing, you'll have to sit and do a little bit of contemplation. Um, so I'm not going to go over anything oddly specific because they're oddly specific and you would need the situation at hand to be able to determine what the best line is. But um, there are a couple of things you need to know offhand when it comes to two amulet draws. And we'll start by the turn two kill. Just getting Titan into play on turn two 
uh, something you can accomplish with two amulets as long as you have a turn one on tap land or like a crumbling vestige to make a mana on turn one that counts too. And then on turn two, you're going to need some kind of instantaneous ramp piece, either an explorer, an Azusa, or a grazer. It's worth noting that Dryad does not work with this uh, the, with this particular line. And I did cover this in my previous video, just the, the brief introduction to amulet video before. So if you've already seen this, then feel free to skip to skip through it. But uh, this starts by playing your turn one vestige or untapped land and playing your amulet. Turn two, you play a second amulet off of the land that's in play. You play a bounce land as your land for turn, and it's going to make four mana total because the amulet triggers do stack. So bounce land, amulet, amulet, untap, make two, untap, make two. That's four total mana before you have to pick the bounce land back up to its own trigger. So you've got four floating. You can play either an explorer or grazer, leaving either two or three mana available. It doesn't really matter. And then that gives you one additional land drop to play Sanctuary again for four more mana. So if you left two mana because you cast Explorer, now you have six exactly. If you left three mana because you played a Grazer, well, now you have seven total. Doesn't matter. That's enough to go ahead and cast a Primeval Titan. In order for the Azusa line to work out, you're going to need two land drops. That's obviously why we need Azusa instead of the Dryad is because the Azusa lets you play two land drops. The Dryad does not. So you'll, on turn two, play your second amulet, play a bounce land floating four, pick up the bounce land, and then play Azusa, leaving one floating. So your first play of your bounce land from Azusa will net you four mana, putting you up to a total of five mana. And then you can play the bounce land one more time in order to net you up to nine mana. So if you had, for example, Simic Growth Chamber, nine mana is enough to pay three, leaving six floating to transmute a Talari West and get a Summoner's Pact, and then use that pact to get a Titan and cast it with your six still floating. So this line would be enough to cast your Primeval Titan after transmuting for the Summoner's Pact. So that makes the Azusa line a little unique. But like I said, you do need to get your extra land drop from Azusa in order for Azusa to cast a turn two Titan. But um, that is just the beginning because we still haven't even talked about how to kill your opponent. We just got Titan into play. So how are we going to kill them? Well, first we're going to search for Boros Garrison and Slayer's Stronghold. And remember that the Stronghold and Garrison entering play tapped will untap twice. So you untap both pay red and white and give your titan plus two plus oh vigilance and haste on tap both again pay a red and white give your titan another plus two plus oh vigilance and haste which makes it a 10 six and then you pick up any land that isn't boros garrison that's very important and then when you attack with your titan you search for sun home for the double strike of course and vesuva to copy your boros garrison that's in play tapped right now and again you get to untap your lands both twice so you Untap your, your copy of Garrison, float red-white. Untap Sunhome, float a colorless. Untap both. Use your Garrison for a red and white and activate Sunhome for double strike on your 10-6 Titan. That's going to be 10 times 2 is 20 damage. So this line with a double amulet does actually let you kill your opponent immediately, but only if you have two amulets in play as opposed to the one amulet line. So it's important to note that if you're playing Hanger Battlements instead of Slayer Stronghold, obviously you're not going to be able to execute this kill because you're not playing Stronghold or Sunhome. You're playing Hanweir instead. So in order to kill your opponent with Hanweir, you have to have a Dryad in play and get Valakut triggers. And that makes it essentially the same as the one amulet kill. I mean, you'll be getting some extra mana. Maybe that means that you can play some extra creatures or whatever, like an Explorer or an Azusa to get some additional land drops. But ultimately, it's going to be exactly the same as before, where you get your Hanweir and your Valkut, and then you attack and get Valkut and Vesuva copying Valkut, and that'll be good enough to kill your opponent. It doesn't matter how many untapped you're getting in that scenario. All right, so let's talk about another double amulet kill, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about for the two amulets. So if you have an Azusa and a Dryad in your hand, two amulets, a Bounce Land, and any untapped source, this is going to allow you to kill your opponent on turn two using Valkut triggers, actually. So you don't need access to Sunhome for this to work. Turn one, you play your untapped land and amulet. Turn two, you play your second amulet. Play a bounce land floating four mana and then pick it back up. Use three of that mana to play, for example, a Dryad. Play your Sanctuary float four. So now you have five total mana. Then you're going to go ahead and play your Azusa, leaving two mana floating. Play a bounce land again, up to six mana. Cast Titan. And then from that point, you can just execute the Vestige Stronghold kill where you leave your enough lands in play to attack with Titan, attack with it, get double Valakut, kill your opponent that way. 
Or you can execute the Stronghold and Sunhome kill if you do have access to Sunhome. You don't have to, though. Um, and this is another line that leads to a turn two win. All right, my throat is starting to get kind of dry. Uh, luckily, there's only a few slides left, so we're just going to cover this one little bit about triple amulet draws, and it's going to be the last thing that I consider to be relevant. I don't think there's anything super special you can do with four amulets. I don't really know. It almost never happens anyways. Triple amulet draws actually don't happen that commonly anyways, so this is going to be the last thing I show you before we kind of conclude the video here. All right, guys, so we're here for one of the final things to look at, the triple amulet kill. This is going to be a line that you, allows you to use a green bounce land, three amulets, and one untapped source to get a grand total of three hasted, double-striked primeval titans all attacking on turn three. And this is accomplished by turn one playing a land and an amulet. So, for example, vestige into amulet. Turn two, you play a second amulet and then play another land. It could be just a bounce land. You don't have to have an extra land. You could play bounce land for a one-time effect to make the mana to play a second amulet and then just pick the bounce land back up and leave Amulet, Amulet, Vestige in play. And then on turn three, you play your third Amulet, if you didn't already play it on turn two, and play your Bounce Land. This is going to make six mana for you, just because you have two per untap, and there's three untaps from your Amulets, so that's going to be six mana. And you can play a Primeval Titan, and it comes into play searching for Talari West and Simic Growth Chamber, floating green, 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 blue, blue, blue from the Simic Growth Chamber, and then the Talari West floats three blue. So in total, you have six blue and three green. You can use three of that blue to transmute your Talari West, leaving six floating, get a Summoner's Pack, pack for a Primeval Titan and play it, leaving no mana floating, but you can do the whole Key West and Simic Growth Chamber thing again, put those two into play, float nine mana, pick up your Key West, transmute it for a Summoner's Pack, pack for a Titan and cast it, leaving no mana floating, um, once you've gotten a third Titan into play, there's really no point in getting a fourth one as you only get three hastes anyways, so you might as well just stop there. Uh, that is assuming you even play a third Talari West. A lot of lists don't. So anyways, your last Primeval Titan is going to help you execute your triple amulet kill. This is going to allow you to swing for a grand total of 48 trampling damage. How the heck is that possible? Well, our third Titan is going to get None other than Boris Garrison and Slayer Stronghold, of course. That's going to be red and white and an activation three times since you have three amulets. So you untap them both once, haste the first titan, untap them again, haste the second titan, untap them again, haste the third titan. Cool. Pick up any land that isn't... I, it doesn't even matter what land you pick up. It could be the Boris Garrison. It doesn't matter because when you attack, you get to search for a grand total of six lands. That's way more than you need. On the first attack trigger, or the attack trigger from the first Titan, you get Gruel Turf and Slesnia Sanctuary, uh, the two red and green, and then green and white bounce lands. You float four mana, including a red and white, untap both. Four mana, including a red and white, untap both. So a grand total of 12 mana with uh, white, 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 red, red, red floating. And then the second attack trigger from your second Primeval Titan attacking gets Sun Home. And you could even just fail to find on a second land. It doesn't matter because your Sun Home is going to be able to untap, activate, untap, activate, untap, activate. So now you have three double-striked hasted titans. That's going to be three eight-six titans that are double-striked. 16 damage each is going to be a grand total of 48 combat damage. So the triple amulet kill, we like to call the squadron titan kill. As each titan lets you search for another titan. Sort of like how squadron hawk lets you search for another squadron hawk. So. Anyways, this video has been long enough. I hope it's been comprehensive and not just massively boring. Let me know if you learned something from it. And uh, like I always say, if you got some entertainment from this video, if you got some enjoyment, then show your support in the ways that you can by leaving a like, commenting about whether I've missed something, if you learned something, just are you going to be building Amulet? I want to know these things. I care, obviously, about the deck, hence why I'm making these videos. So, and finally, Please, if you do have a friend that would like to watch some amulet content, a very in-depth guide at that, then share this video. I don't typically promote my own content, although this one and the last one that I feel are very broadly in general reaching, I don't mind sharing those because I feel like they are genuinely just some useful information. But if it's just me playing through a league, for example, I'm not going to share those videos to social media because who cares about me playing through a league? Sometimes I don't even care. Sometimes I'm just doing it because I want to have some fun playing some memes or whatever. But 
Anyways, if you like my stuff, then support me as I'm supporting you right now. And I have nothing else to say. This is Red Face Menace. Signing off.